fourth panel uh, of the day, fourth panel uh, and the last panel, uh, which is um, entitled Diplomacy During the Armistice. Uh, we have three speakers, the two speakers here uh, with us and um, uh, a third speaker uh, online. Uh, so I just would like to um, say a few words uh, about um, our speakers uh, and the titles of their papers uh, before we begin. So the first speaker is uh, Dimitar uh, Tasic. Um, he has a bachelor's, master's, and uh, a PhD degree in history at the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Belgrade. He's a senior research associate um, at the Institute for the Recent History in Serbia. His research interests include 20th century history, military history, war studies, uh, and paramilitarism. His paper today is entitled Between Just Ended War and Postponed Peace, Mission of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes uh, in Istanbul. Our um, next speaker is uh, Claire Lebra. She received her PhD degree at the Center um, de Recherche en Histoire uh, Internationale et Atlantique at Nantes University. She is currently an associate researcher at the same center. She is also a researcher at IFEA in Istanbul. Her work focuses on the history of diplomacy, the Ottoman Empire, and Turkey uh, in the 20th century. Her paper today is entitled Representing Constantinople and Ankara, Ottoman Diplomats Facing Governmental Duality in Turkey. The third speaker is um, Eden Naby Fry. Um, she graduated from Temple University in 1964 and began her career in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan. She received her PhD degree in literature at Columbia University in 1975. She taught different courses at Harvard University, the University of Massachusetts, University of Wisconsin and Columbia University. She has curated six exhibits about Assyrians and Middle East minorities. She has publications on Assyrians, Assyrian culture and Afghanistan. Her paper is entitled An Assyrian Iranian Family in Istanbul. Uh, in Istanbul negotiates passage to New York, currencies, political sectors and safe passage. So we now turn to our first speaker, uh, Dimitar uh, Tasic. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. this. Um, uh, thank you very much for the organizer for having me here. It is really uh, a pleasure to be part and to participate in such a splendidly organized and interactive conference. I must say, you know, the interaction is great. Uh, I will just speak about this episode from the very dynamic relations which marked the uh, between the, at that time, Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes and uh, newly and the uh, fading Ottoman Empire and newly rising the Turkish Republic. Uh, already in December of 1918, newly created Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, which I will in the next far parts of my presentation call the Yugoslav state because it's much easier and it's much more familiar. It founded its military mission in the Ottoman state in Constantinople and in Smyrna. Since the final peace agreement hasn't been signed yet, they operated military missions within the framework of the Entente Occupation Forces. In October of next year, they evolved to diplomatic mission with primary concern to oversee and protect the rights of several thousands of Yugoslav subjects living and working in the Ottoman state, 
these people, some 4,500 4, of them only in Constantinople, worked in various businesses, small and large, and they originated from various parts of newly founded Yugoslav state. Everything that marked the post-Great post War realities and relations between two states was complex on multitude of levels. These complexities derived from the dynamic relations, not only from previous decades, but from the entire previous epoch. Serbia's 19th century, century struggle for independence, Great Easter Crisis, the Eastern question, Macedonian question, and the course and the outcomes of the Balkan Wars of 1912-1930 were prominent features of these complex and dynamic relations. For example, an attempt to regulate and resolve issues between Serbia and the Ottoman state that came as a result of the Balkan Wars affected their later relations. Supposedly definite peace agreement between Serbia and the Ottoman state, also known as the Convention of Constantinople, was signed in March of 1914. It envisaged a period of three years during which subjects of both states could opt for one of two citizenships. During that period, they could sell their properties. If they wanted, they could keep their possessions. However, relocation of the state of their choosing was mandatory. Those who opted for change of citizenship were allowed to keep their properties, but they could administer them through authorized individuals. Also, during the three years period, Muslims for so-called uh, uh, former Ottoman regions or, regions or newly associated regions, how they call it in Serbia, Kosovo, Sanjak and Macedonia, would be exempted from conscription or any other military contribution. However, Convention of Constantinople remained dead letter since the outbreak of the Great War and Ottoman alignment with the Central Powers in the Ottoman 1914 prevented its ratification and practical implementation. The fact that it hasn't been uh, ratified would have serious repercussion later on. Although the first war year proved to be successful for Serbia, a massive offensive launched by the combined forces of Germany, Austro-Hungary and Bulgaria, Bulgaria in the Ottoman 1915 resulted in defeat, occupation and division of Serbia. Its sovereign government, parliament and army refused to surrender and withdrew across Albanian mountains to the Adriatic coast. The Austro-Hungarians, following their traditional pro-Albanian and in general pro-Muslim policies, began with the enlistment of Albanians and Slavic-speaking Muslims from Kosovo and the Sanjak of Novi Pazar. Despite formerly being Serbian citizens, those, these conscripts were used to fill the ranks of the Ottoman army as well as the Austro-Hungarian auxiliary formations. All the Austro-Hungarians had their own agenda behind this conscription. They also allowed the Ottoman officials to act accordingly. Ottoman justification for such an action was that defeat and the occupation of Serbia annulled the aforementioned Convention of Constantinople, thus permitting the Ottomans to enlist their former subjects. From Habsburg occupied Serbia, so this is how this occupation uh, region looked like, from Habsburg occupied Serbia between 1916 and 1918. Some 30,000 men were mobilized, as well as between four and 6,000 from Habsburg occupied Montenegro. These men were sent to various battlefields of the Great War. Already during the 1919, Yugoslav mission in Constantinople became overwhelmed with several thousand requests coming from Muslims originating from different parts of Yugoslav state. They all asked for permission to return to their homeland. Uh, this application included immigrants from before the 1912, then the refugees that left the Balkans as a consequences of the Balkan Wars, those who immigrated during the period between the Balkan Wars and the First World War, those who immigrated before Serbia withdrawal across Albania, those who immigrated after the Serbian withdrawal, and who by rule claimed they were deported, and also there were a number of Bosnian Muslims who came to the Ottoman Empire before and after the Austro-Hungarian annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1908. Among those demands repatriation were approximately 4,000 Muslims from Sanjak of Novi Pazar who the Austro-Hungarians mobilized for the Ottoman army. They faced immense difficulties awaiting repatriation without any income or, or material support after being released from British captivity. They all claimed to have been forceful, forcefully mobilized in the Ottoman army. This particular uh, issue resulted in different interpretation by various Yugoslav state ministries and agencies involved in the matter. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry for the Interior, Mission in Constantinople, and Ministry of Land Reform. 
after an initial benevolent approach, which resulted in permitting applicants to return, all re to return to Yugoslavia, already in 1920, Yugoslav Mission stopped issuing new repatriation passports. Initially, Yugoslav Mission considered that the only last category, the Bosnian Muslims, should be allowed to return to the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, but not to their homeland in Bosnia, but to Macedonia, where being native speakers of Serbian, they would be given the task of spreading the Serbian language and in that way influencing the local population. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, however, suggested that only those male individuals from the Sanjak of Novi Pazar who served in the Ottoman army should be allowed to return to their homes. Bosnian Muslims were generally, however, should not be allowed to return at all. At that moment, the possible return of Muslim refugees and immigrants collided with the state intentions to simultaneously execute the land reform and colonization of Kosovo and Yugoslav Macedonia because a considerable amount of land for distribution derived from so-called abandoned land, that is to say, land in these regions which was abandoned by their primary Muslim owners in the course of the Balkan Wars. Local authorities in Macedonia spoke of disturbances resulting from the return of some Muslim landowners reclaiming properties which have been sequestrated. This led to the Ministry of Land Reform to compose a memo for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which was forwarded to the head of the mission of in Constantinople, in which it openly expressed Yugoslav attitudes toward any eventual return of Muslim refugees and immigrants. The memo stated that the Ottoman returns were considered as proven enemy of our state because they were endangering ongoing land reform, which saw former serfs becoming free owners of the land they have cultivated. They were categorized as those who were impeding the progress. In addition, it is said that they were complicating already difficult work of police and local authorities. The conclusion of the Ministry of, uh, was that they should not be allowed to return and that in cooperation with Ministry of Interior, all those who express desire to return uh, should be registered while their timing and motivations for leaving the land, their destination and the mar mar marital status, status should be back-checked. In that moment, two ministries clashed over the question of prioritizing the repatriation of former prisoners of war with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs being in favor and the Ministry of the Interior being opposed. The latter even wrote that these people who never render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's and if they ever render it, they did it when forced to and, and who are constituting 60% of those living in South, southern Serbia will completely suppress our people. If we start allowing them to return from immigration to spread around our properties already taken from them, Muslim people have already returned in sufficient quantity so that rise in number was already noticed. And in the same time, we can feel their predominance over our population, which is not in our favor. Nevertheless, some of these so-called Ottomans did manage to overcome official obstacles and obtain documents either through bribery or by, by applying for repatriation uh, document, documents elsewhere, such as in Salonica in Greece, or in the consulates of other states, as in Italy, Bulgaria or Spain. During an interrogation in the Bitola municipality, a returnee, Tefik Pasha, a former general in the Ottoman army, stated that he had paid a Yugoslav official to insert his name in the list of the Ottoman prisoners of war of Yugoslav origin, released from the British custody. By doing that, he managed to obtain a repatriation, a repatriation passport. Another tried to obtain repatriation documents by presenting certificates issued by Yugoslav municipalities from which they originated, which they obtained through personal intercessions. Some also attempted to return with forged papers. What happened in the following months was raised against the, the clock. Those who applied for repatriation passport had to wait while their individual cases were transferred from the Yugoslav mission to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and further on to the Ministry of Interior and local police, which was assigned to conduct thorough security check in relation to the circumstances of their recruitment to the Ottoman forces. While waiting, applicants either stayed in army barracks where Ottoman authorities provided them with necessary provisions or they worked in nearby coal mines. They also put a pressure on the Yugoslav mission by simply sitting there for hours, thus impeding its normal functioning. Another pressure came from the British occupying forces, which wanted this issue to be resolved as soon as possible, especially taking in mind events that began to unfold in the East, where some of the former soldiers from the Balkans decided to join Mustafa Kemal's forces while awaiting for repatriation. 
one way or another, eventually, most of them manage to return to their old or you can say new homeland. Their cases clearly speak of difficulties and problems the authority of the nascent, nascent state were facing. However, this case also speaks of present anti-Muslim attitudes, which in years to come led to the creation of equally anti-Muslim policies. The mission in Constantinople also followed developments in neighboring Bulgaria in relation to the action of internal Macedonian revolutionary organization. In addition, one of its important tasks was the establishment of contacts with the rebel forces and government led by Mustafa Kemal in Ankara. In Yugoslav mission in Constantinople, from the beginning, they were aware of the power of the Turkish national movement, and uh, whose power and influences were constantly rising, opposing to the Ottoman government in Constantinople. Quite early, in May 1921, it had established clandestine contacts with Ankara government, and they maintained regular contacts, which became intensive after the signing, the signing of the armistice in Mudanya in September of 1922. During initial phases of Lausanne Peace Conference happened official meeting between representatives of Kingdom of Serb, Croats and Slovenes and Ankara government, which led to the clearing of existing issues and misunderstanding, primarily related to the uh, claims that the um, movement of Mustafa Kemal is supporting the Bulgarian uh, uh, or, uh, issue and uh, internal Macedonian revolutionary organization. And uh, this uh, clearing of issues uh, led to the transformation of Yugoslav mission from mission to general consulate, which starting from December 1st, 1922. However, Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes again refused to sign Peace Treaty of Lausanne, like it did with the Peace Treaty in Sever. Uh, again, as in the case of Sever Treaty, reason was the same, issue of the Ottoman death. Simply, uh, Yugoslav uh, government refused to accept uh, uh, obligation to pay the rest of the Ottoman debt, the, the debt which Ottoman Empire owned to the Western powers, uh, because you know uh, they decide they decided actually to redistribute that debt according to the territories, uh, success, success, succession of territories of the Ottoman Empire. Considerable part of that of also be, uh, belong to the belong to the Yugoslav state, and practically in both cases they refused to to pay it. It would require several years to reach the point in which a separate peace agreement would be signed between Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes and Republic of Turkey. In following years, issue of sequestered, sequestrated properties of Ottoman and slash Turkish subjects in Yugoslav state became important tool for demonstrating diplomatic pressure. Finally, on October 25th, 1925 in Ankara, uh, they signed not only an agreement on, on peace, but it was in the same time agreement on peace and friendship between Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes and Republic of Turkey. And uh, this uh, signing of this agreement actually marked the beginning of new era in relations between two states. Uh, the question of properties and the Ottoman debt would be resolved during the following decade. So in the, in the middle of the 30s, uh, actually, the and also the compensation Compensation uh, paid it for the la land which was uh, uh, sequestrated and, co and uh, well, how can you say confiscated after the Balkan Wars was also among this question which was resolved during the 30s. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, so before starting, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this colloquium for preparing these two very stimulating days and uh, allowing me to uh, participate. So my talk uh, is titled Representing Istanbul and Ankara, Ottoman Diplomat Facing Governmental Duality in Turkey. It is based on research I carried out in the framework of my PhD dissertation, which uh, dealt with uh, diplomatic practice during the period of uh, armistice. So today I will uh, attempt to highlight several aspects 
of this period by focusing on the point of view of one uh, category of actors, the diplomats or personalities who act as diplomats for the Ottoman Empire. The sources I rely on uh, are the writing of these characters as well as diplomatic documents coming from um, Ottoman, French, Italian and other uh, archives. So I will first uh, present uh, an overview uh, of the diplomatic scene during this period, pointing out its characteristics and the challenges the Ottoman Empire had to face. I will then focus on the backgrounds and experiences of uh, three um, individuals who, uh, in a professional or casual capacity, represented the Ottoman Empire to the United States of America. Uh, based on the avail available information regarding their actions and experiences, I wish to uh, trace the ambiguities of, um, of this period. Uh, let me uh, begin by recalling uh, the London Conference of January-February 1921 that remained a landmark political and uh, diplomatic event of the armistice period. It was indeed remarkable by the presence at the same time of two Turkish uh, Ottoman delegation. One, one was led by a Grand, Grand Vizier Tefik Pasha, representing the imperial government of Istanbul, and the other uh, was led by Bekir Sami Bey, representing the government of the Grand National Assembly of Ankara. That means that uh, the governmental duality of the Ottoman state, that is, um, the coexistence of two competing governments within it became visible on the internal stage um, during this conference. This is uh, one of the peculiarities of the Ottoman diplomatic scene I would like to point, uh, to point out, the governmental uh, duality during the armistice period. Uh, we have two competing political entities who, that do not recognize each other, uh, the attempts at rapprochement between 1920 and 1921 ended in failure. These two governments nevertheless shared common characteristics uh, regarding their position on the diplomatic chessboard. Um, so both governments of Istanbul and Ankara sought to establish or re-establish a diplomatic network by sending representatives uh, to foreign governments. But these representations were uh, hampered in several ways. Uh, first, uh, the diplomacy of both governments faced recent adversity provoked by the World War. Because the states they represented had been defeated, the Ottoman representatives were often met with the defiance during their mission abroad, including in neutral countries. Moreover, some of the Allied powers, namely France and England, for example, did not hesitate to exert pressure on the, on the Ottoman leaders in order to remove the representative uh, who had ostensibly shown the support for Germany a few years earlier. Uh, also, in order to communicate with the administration, Ottoman representatives abroad uh, often relied on the Allies government who supervised and uh, controlled their co correspondence. Uh, so second, uh, the stigmas affecting Tur Ottoman uh, representatives abroad resulted from the intermediate state of their relation with the Allied powers. Uh, at uh, the beginning of the Great War between 1914 and 1946 uh, and 1916, the government of Istanbul gradually broke off its uh, diplomatic relation with the Allied power. After the signing of the armistice, uh, the delay in concluding a lasting peace led to a grey area. Uh, the diplomatic relations between the government of Istanbul and the Allies were characterized by the transitional state where neither war nor peace uh, was uh, officially acknowledged. Consequently, exchanges of diplomatic representatives uh, took place outside a normalized legal framework. As for the government of Ankara, its recent constitution caused uh, most of the other governments not to recognize it as uh, one of their own. 
to, to sum up, the Istanbul and Ankara governments were disqualified, one as a defeated power and the other as an unrecognized uh, authority. And finally, the imperial and um, nationalist diplomatic services were experiencing uh, resource uh, difficulties. Pending the conclusion of peace and in anticipation of reparation imposed on the Ottoman state, the sublime port's resources were frozen. Uh, consequently, the government in Istanbul faced increasing difficulties in paying uh, its officials. And for the government in Ankara, an important handicap was the lack of trained diplomatic personnel uh, among its partners. Uh, this uh, condition um, the, that were seriously affecting the development of Ottoman diplomacy at the end of the Great War provoked a dualization of diplomatic interaction and the status. Along, alongside the um, the official representation led by Istanbul and Ankara with only a few um, with only a few partners, alternative forms of diplomatic representations were implemented in order to circumvent diplomatic rupture and non-recognition. Uh, it is within this framework that representatives of uh, Istanbul and Ankara were welcomed in the Allied capitals in Paris, Roma and London. Uh, this representation adopted apparent form of diplomatic exchange, but were deployed in, in an unofficial setting because the host authority denies them any official character. Uh, to conclude uh, this quick overview of the Ottoman diplomatic scene, it was characterized by a plurality of missions assigned to its uh, representative. Uh, on the one and uh, as revealed by the London Conference of 1921, the diplomatic corps of Istanbul and Ankara uh, were very active in the renegotiation of the peace treaty. The thought from the Allies a revision of even an annulment of the Treaty of Sèvres. Consequently, for these two governments, it was necessary to impose the negotiators and to create a balance of powers that would be favorable to the, the, the interest of the country. On the other hand, is, uh, Istanbul and Ankara developed a diplomacy of influence in order to restore the, the reputation of the country. Uh, discredited for its uh, involvement on Germany's side in the conflict and the crime against uh, its Christian population, the sublime port had to improve the, the country's image. So in addition to um, propaganda objectives, it was more and more needing to rely on uh, international partners in order to secure financial and material support. And this issue concerned both Istanbul and Ankara, which had to finance its military operation against Greek army in Anatolia. So finally, uh, the constitution of a diplomatic networks also involved a symbolic issue either by sending delegates uh, or hosting uh, a diplomatic corps, Istanbul and Ankara governments sought to assert their existence and to improve uh, their legitimacy. So diplomatic representation was, were a crucial issue for the rulers in Istanbul and Ankara uh, with regard of their internal uh, rivalry. Uh, so in the... In the second part of, um, of my paper, I would like to introduce um, a micro-historical analysis, which was also part of my PhD uh, research. I would like to present very brief briefly the trajectories of three people who contributed to the representation of the Ottoman state abroad during the uh, armistice period. Uh, the short, short um, bi biographies uh, give me the opportunity to insist on the ambiguities of an extremely uh, complex uh, period. First of all, um, Richard Black Bay belonged to a French family settled in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire since the mid-19th uh, century and was well inserted in the imperial structures. In 1918, uh, he was the Ottoman Embassy Councillor in Vienna since 1911. 
We called to Istanbul at the beginning of 1920. He found himself, like many of his, his colleagues, affected by the, by the contraction of the diplomatic network of Istanbul. And uh, in a daily correspondence with his wife in Vienna, Black Bear tell us about the difficulties of the Ottoman, of an Ottoman Empire official in the post-war context. Uh, as Istanbul government could not officially send representative abroad, he found himself unemployed, except for a few missions he carried out with the American High Commissioner in Istanbul. He also participated for a few weeks as a member of the Imperial Delegation to the London Conference in 1921. He received almost no salary and was very preoccupied about uh, his future in the Ottoman diplomatic career. Facing uh, this uh, instability, Black Bay considered on several occasions uh, leaving the service of the Ottoman Empire either to settle in the United States or to join Ankara. Uh, indeed, Black Bay became increasingly um, interested in the new government in, in Anatolia. He followed the news of the fighting between Ankara's troops and the Greek forces, uh, rejoices at each uh, defeat of the latter. He even said that he was in contact with the Ankara government through some of his friends who were there. However, he did not decide to leave the service of the imperial government. Uh, his persistence uh, can be explained uh, in part by the loyalty and attachment uh, that he expressed on several occasions towards the Ottoman Empire. Uh, moreover, in a context where the pursuit of a career depends largely on the circle of relationships and personal connection, uh, the Anatolian adventure and the break with the, with the imperial diplomacy constitute an important risk. Uh, also, unlike uh, the military officers who were permanently unemployed during the armistice, the diplomatic personnel had the possibility, albeit highly constrained, of exercising their skills in the service of the Ottoman state. And um, for example, for Black Bay, uh, from the beginning of 1921, he had reason to hope that he could be appointed as a special delegate to Washington. The sublime port uh, needed for propaganda in the United States and Black Bay, whose wife was uh, American, could uh, very well carry out uh, these missions thanks to his uh, relatives and contacts. And at the end of March 1921, Turkish newspaper published the news of his candidacy for the Washington position. However, for financial uh, reasons, the unofficial representation of the Istanbul government in Washington was finally entrusted uh, to Ayn Naum Effendi, who traveled to the United States uh, in October uh, 1921. So I would like now to turn uh, on uh, the example of individuals who were more involved in a dual position at the interface between the governments in uh, Istanbul and Ankara. Uh, and uh, with an I'm Naum Effendi. After studying in Paris, uh, he served as a, a rabbi in Istanbul and taught French uh, at the Ottoman military school. Uh, through contact with the new military elite, he became a supporter of the Young Turk Revolution of 1908. That same year, he was elected chief rabbi of the Ottoman Empire, a position he held uh, until his resignation in March 1920. So during the Great War, he undertook several diplomatic missions for the Young Turk government to explore the possibilities of a separate peace with the Allies. In the post-war period, um, uh, Naum Effendi quickly showed his sympathy for the nationalist movement. He made several trips to the United States and France to influence public opinion in favor of the Ottoman Empire. And in October uh, 1921, the government in Istanbul uh, offered him to act as an Ottoman delegate in uh, Washington. 
he made uh, several visits to Washington during um, which he actually defended uh, the struggles of the nationalist movement. In the uh, autumn of uh, 1922, back in Europe, he continued its propaganda activities in favor of the Ankara government and uh, its proximity to the authority of Ankara and uh, its numerous contact with the uh, European elites um, and also the fact that he belonged to a religious minority of the empire made it an, uh, an important uh, diplomatic asset. That's why uh, he then joined the Turkish delegation uh, at the Lausanne conference in 1922. Uh, finally, uh, another example of dual diplomatic activity is given by uh, Muftizade Mehmet Kazem Ziya. Uh, belonging to a family of Ottoman diplomats, he is the third son of Mustafa Rashid Pasha, as a representative of Sublime Port in London between 1921 and 1922. Married to an American citizen, he has lived in the United States since uh, the early 1910. He returned to Turkey be between 1921 and 1922. He established contacts with both uh, the Istanbul and Ankara governments. In June 1922, he explained that the American government wished to establish an official contact with the both uh, Ottoman governments and that Washington would be willing to host an economic agent. The agent, while having no political or diplomatic status, could carry out propaganda against uh, the detractors of the Ottoman Empire in the United States. So the Abbe offered to fulfill this role for both the Istanbul and uh, the Ankara government. It has uh, not been possible to ascertain um, uh, how this proposal of dual activity uh, was received by the imperial government and the nationalist government. However, uh, it is uh, not worth it that uh, the Yabe did carry out uh, the propaganda activity that it un intended to perform. This was done in a book entitled uh, Speaking of the Turks, published in 1922 in the United States. This book is written as a testimony and an account of uh, the trip of the Yabe to his native country after years of absence. But adopting the nationalist uh, discourses, it is in fact a presentation of the profound changes the country is undergoing and the economic opportunities it offers to uh, potential American investors. So to conclude uh, really briefly, um, uh, if I have to sum up the main idea of this paper, I would say that beyond uh, the structural analysis and diplomatic dynamics of the period, of this period. Uh, it is particularly interesting to look at the actors' uh, individual stories because uh, it, um, they help us to access the point of view of uh, individuals uh, caught up in a complex uh, crisis, the outcome of which was very uncertain. It allies their expectations, the constraint on them, and also uh, their adaptation uh, strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, now we can move on to the third speaker. Hello, Ms. Fry, uh, can you hear us? I can hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, Please go ahead uh, with your uh, presentation. I have um, already um, given your uh, biography and the title of your uh, paper. Very good. Can you, can you see my screen or not? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Can you say it now? No. Okay.
uh, please click the share screen button, green button in the center uh, bottom uh, line. Oh, in the center. Yeah. Share screen and then click OK. Mm. Oh, yes. OK, I see. All right. See? No? You can't see it yet? No. Uh, do, do you have your presentation open on your um, screen? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so, I do. Yeah, so when you share screen, can you select your screen? Yeah, and then after that. Ah, select my screen. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. I share. Ah, this is what I was Siyah afraid of. Siyah çizgi, hangi siyah çizgi? Dikteki siyah çizginin üzerinde. O onu gördü sanıyorum. Ye yeşil. Yeşile yeşile basıyor. Ondan sonra Olur tabii tabii tabii. Uh, Miss Fry, um, is it okay if we share it here? Uh, and I. Yeah, go ahead. That's easier. Yes. Okay. And then I'll <laughs> see you when when you can switch switch the slide, okay? Okay. Good. So you have my first slide. An Iran a Syrian Iranian family in Istanbul negotiates passage to New York. Just a second. And then go to my next slide, please. Slide two. Uh, just a second. Ready? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So in 1914, <laughs> together with religious and ethnic tensions mounted in Northwest Iran, a Syrian family from the Assyrian and Armenian village of Karajalu became alarmed for its safety. Five members of that family walked 200 kilometers north to the Tsarist Russian border to board the train for Tiflis, the chief city in Transcaucasia. Tiflis, a multi-ethnic city in the Georgian ethnic area, had been the historic location from which Assyrians traveled back and forth to and from Europe and the United States during the latter part of the 19th century. For decades, they had avoided Ottoman-held areas and rarely planned their passage through Istanbul mainly due to the unruly region of eastern Turkey where roads were dominated by Kurdish tribes living adjacent to Iran. Two members of the family had been visiting from New York, a son named Abraham and his American wife Harriet. As U.S. citizens, upon reaching Tiflis, they sought the U.S. consulate and managed to leave for the U.S. in 1915 across Russia through London to New York. The other three family members remained stuck in Tiflis for six years since they carried Persian travel documents and needed visas to travel internationally. Moreover, World War I soon closed the usual travel route through Russia, Germany, and on to New York. The search for travel options narrowed. Soon after World War I ended and the Russian Civil War continued, the only option for travel became occupied Istanbul, uh, Constantinople, 
given that the collapse of the Ottoman Empire allowed the victors to enter western parts of the empire. Next slide, please. Yes. Sources. Original sources are rare for this period from indigenous Assyrian records. Missionaries and Assyrians already living in the United States provide some materials, but authentic Assyrian voices experiencing the deprivations, disease, and genocide are rare. Records, journals, and correspondence, if retained in such circumstances, have been lost since then. Assyrians as a stateless people have few reliable archival institutions, even for the broad range of period, except for the broad range of periodicals dating from the mid 19th century. It remains for families to retain resources for the modern history of Assyrians and families lose language ability and toss materials in the trash. Parts of the history of this family have been recovered through letters and objects preserved among descendants living in California. The items related to their family history formed an exhibit in, in 2022 with a catalog that started in Sunnyvale, a small town outside San Jose, California, and will be traveling to various campuses in the United States and internationally over the next two years. Then most of the items will be archived at Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. This presentation is based on part of that exhibit, the Persian passport of John Yusuf, issued in Tiflis in 1921, and a wad of paper currency that remained in his possession and was passed on in the family until its donation to UC Berkeley. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay. Assyrian villages in northwestern Iran. Prior to World War I and the scattering of surviving Assyrians, this last ethnic group that has preserved Neo-Aramaic lived in a cross-border situation between the Ottoman Empire and Qajar Iran. Identified often through their Christian denominational affiliations, a national secular identity had surfaced among them during the late 19th century based on occasional historic self-identification with the ancient Assyrian Empire, then being rediscovered in Mesopotamia. The paramount identity of the modern Assyrians by their Muslim neighbors was as Christians, with the exception of Armenians who knew them as Isor. During the presence of American missionaries, the ABCFM since 1835, by West World War One. Iran's Assyrians had benefited from a network of schools reaching down to every village and including both male and female Assyrian students. These schools were conducted in the vernacular Neo-Aramaic of the region and were suitably equipped with textbooks, a first in the modern period for any living Aramaic language. Thus, Assyrians had become the leading indigenous physicians serving all ethnic groups and the sole, nearly total, totally literate ethnic group in Iran. An illustration of the high achievement of Iran's Assyrians is that they traveled internationally and before World War I produced the main English language books on Iran, or Persia it was, as it was termed in English, published in the United States and Britain. The shock of the destruction of World War I and the concomitant genocide against Christians destroyed not only two-thirds of the Assyrian population of the Middle East, but also broke down village life. Security became the main concern and large towns were regarded as more secure. The family that ended up in Istanbul would never return to their village. Next slide, please. Life in Tiflis, 1914 to 1920. As the war dragged on, the family applied to the American consulate in Tiflis for help with passage and visas while coping with the gradually escalating Russian civil war that engulfed Transcaucasia in, after 1917. Without their earlier evangelizing Protestant contacts in Tiflis, they might not have survived 
to reach Ellis Island in 1922 with little money, but what their family settled in California was able to send them via the Near East Foundation. The Near East Foundation, as you know, was called something else since 1915 and aimed mainly to help Assyrians and, uh, and Armenians. The wallet full of paper currency rep represents the political turmoil and the rapid shifts in the fate of ephemeral governments. Armenian, Georgian, Greek, Baku Commune, and six other currencies were, there, were in this wallet, kept by family descendants, researched and exhibited in 1920. In 2022. This letter is a correspondence from the family in 1915. Next slide, please. While the 13 year old John had traveled out of Iran on his father's passport, the long years the three family members had to spend in Tiflis necessitated his acquiring a Persian passport of his own. The documents he got in 1921 were in three languages Persian, Russian and French. The travel documents for the other families have not survived, but John's passport testifies to the chaotic political situation in Transcaucasia. Passage north on the Russian rail and sea travel routes were closed due to the raging international war in which Russia and Germany were on opposite sides. Travel south through Turkey was not possible due to the confrontation between the CUP-led forces and Russia. Next slide, please. Ever hopeful that they would be able to leave Tiflis, they appear to, to have given up hope of returning to their Iranian village. The World War, then the Russian Civil War that engulfed Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan between 1918 and 1922 blocked passage. Finally, the Allied victory in the war and the subsequent occupation of, of Constantinople following the armistice of Mudros, October 1918, opened the possibility of departure from the conflict zone. Next slide, please. This, thus, the family got permission to board passage on an Italian ship, Aria, out of Batum, the port of Tiflis on the Black Sea, on 19 April 1921 but it took them another three months to arrive in, in Constantinople. Why? The reason may be found in the half dozen letters that are waiting for researchers to examine at Berkeley. Some of the problem must have stemmed from financial hardship. They had no means of support except for the funds channeled to them by the two brothers living in the United States. As is known from the records of the Near East Foundation, which was active in Tiflis, diverting funds to this war-disrupted region of Asia entailed much delay. Paying for passage on the Aria, then on a Greek ship out of Constantinople to Piraeus in Greece, meant waiting for the arrival of more funds. Little remains of how they fared in this city divided into four sections by the triumphant allies, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Greece. They had to navigate the four sections of the city, acquire the Persian consulate general permit to leave Constantinople in August 1921, acquire an acceptable American visa, and get the final stamp allowing exit from the city aboard the Greek ship Acropolis on December 21, 1921. They arrived in New York on January 24, 1922. Again, an examination of the letters held at UC Berkeley could shed more light on how they managed in Istanbul for the months when they arranged for passage to New York. Next slide, please. Others who tried to leave Iran in that same period often had to travel by road and then sail through British controlled regions of the world across the Pacific Ocean to reach relatives in the US. An example is the two-page travel document for Ludia Shumun, a native of another Assyrian village in Iran, Gertepe, whose route was far more circuitous than that of the Yusuf family. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Most 
of the paper currency that is preserved in the use of family had already expired as spendable by the time John reached Istanbul. The 1919 Armenian ruble worth 100 rubles lost all value with the fall of the First Republic of Armenia in 1920 when it was overrun by the Red Army. Next slide, please. The same holds true for the currency of the Democratic Republic of Georgia. Next one, please. After 1921, when it succumbed to the Red Army. Eventually, even the 500 ruble note issued by the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic, the RSFSR, with its seven language call for the workers of the world to unite, stopped being issued after 1921. I will conclude now by saying that numismatics is an old historical field, even when the actual financial value of the currency has ended. Thus, together with official documents such as travel documents, correspondence, and oral history, they allow a glimpse into how some histories may be recovered, even of a stateless people like the Assyrians. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fry. Um, now we can move on to questions and comments uh, from the audience here and also uh, online. Thanks to all for your very compelling presentations. My question is uh, for Claire Lebras. A very interesting point of view from with the. And I was wondering if um, there, w with this diplomatic shift, transition, tension, there was uh, was visible in the languages used, like the diplomatic languages up to then. I think had been French in the re previous decades. Was there a shift towards English starting already then, or was it was there were there issues related to languages that you could talk about? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, actually, the, my response will, will be uh, very brief. I, uh, at this time, the French was still uh, a diplomatic language for all uh, all, all countries and. Uh, in, uh, English start to uh, to impose itself, but uh, until the World War II, uh, French was the main uh, language at, at this time. So basically, uh, most of the document I could uh, uh, read in the, uh, for example, Ottoman archives were in French. For, we have some document in Turkish, but uh, uh, in Ottoman Turkish, but. Uh, mostly in French. <coughs> so as we wait um, for maybe <coughs> questions and comments, maybe I can ask um, to um, uh, Dimitar Tasic. Um, I was uh, wondering about the legal framework uh, for properties um, in the kingdom. 
um, what um, what kind of a context we can uh, talk about um, with regard to property holding uh, and uh, how that uh, relates to uh, the demands of um, the um, people trying to repatriate. Thank you. So the situation was like this. After the Balkan Wars, the Serbian government uh, proclaimed that uh, if some land is not cultivated for two consecutive years, it, sh it is going to be confiscated by the state. So in many cases, many landowners, uh, primarily from the south regions of, uh, which were un annexed after the Balkan Wars, left, not many, not, not all, but some, and this land was taken into consideration for the colonization. Already after the First Balkan War, there were announcements and uh, people were invited, primarily Serbs from Serbia and abroad, and also other who are interested to come and uh, colonize this land. However, the properties in the cities, uh, like houses and everything, were just sequestrated. They were not confiscated. So legally, these people could actually return and uh, take their uh, possessions in the cities like these houses and uh, um, Konak's palace, whatever. But the agricultural land was, uh, was the one which was considered to be uh, confiscated. Of course, the first Balkan War, uh, the, first, uh, the uh, outbreak of the First World War uh, cancelled the whole, whole operation already. But some per permits were already issued to some people. There was there was a legal framework, very very detailed. Who 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 can actually apply? Uh, they have to be um, uh, without a criminal record. Uh, with the, primarily those who were poor were meant to be sent there because you know people often uh, because of this kind of. Uh, demographic boom which was happening all over the place you know people uh, these lands were uh, considered as good for for colonization and of course also because the serbian state wanted to to uh, press its own agenda in this newly newly how they call it newly associated regions so the first world war cancelled all of this but immediately after the war almost 1990 1920 they actually proclaimed that all Pri uh, all prior Serbian laws which were considered for the implementation in the newly associated regions were, uh, uh, were to be applied again, this time in Yugoslav context, because also uh, people from these new territories, especially from poor, poor lands, because in uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, parts of uh, Yugoslavia, former Austro-Hungarian parts of Yugoslavia, some of them were very, you can say, mountainous and poor, and uh, they also had always this kind of demographic uh, uh, um, immigrants going uh, elsewhere. For example, Serbia uh, was not uh, the land of emigration, it was land of immigration. Between 1878 and 1908, 400,000 people came to live in Serbia from either Ottoman Empire, either from uh, Montenegro, from Herzegovina, or from Romania. And these lands, uh, which were uh, belonged to Austro-Hungarian Empire, mostly inhabited by South Slavs, like Serbs and Croats, were seen as good for resolving the demographic pressure which existed there. A lot of people, a uh, little agricultural land. So the regions of uh, northern parts of Vojvodina, for example, and southern parts of Kosovo and Macedonia were seen as very convenient for the settlement of this South Slavic uh, element. And of course, let us not forget, you know, the, the true outcome of the First World War is rise of national idea, nationalism, and even racism, I must say. So, for example, this, uh, uh, the whole uh, Yugoslav idea and the whole, uh, for, for the whole idea of Yugosla Yugoslav state was the strengthening of the South Slavic element. So all others were in a way undesirable. For example, I will just make an example for, because for example, among the Russian immigrants in Yugoslavia, during the 20s and 30s, there was about um, three, ta three to 4,000 Kalmyks, the mm, people of Mongolian origin. And when the Yugoslav state passed the uh, uh, law on citizenship, they were not considered as convenient, they were not considered at all for naturalization. Only so S -S Slavic Russians, Sl Russians and Ukrainians and Belarusians were seen as uh, uh, convenient for naturalization. So, you know, this is kind of global thing uh, at, at, that, at that time. <laughs> 
Gracias. Um, hi, sorry, just to follow up on what you uh, said, were, were there, um, uh, were there um, Yugoslav Muslims that wanted to um, uh, uh, immigrate to Turkey? And were they, do you know if they were given permission to do so? Um, like the reverse direction? Oh, yes, but later on in the 20s. Uh, at that moment, at that moment, I'm not I'm not aware of the fact that, that there was massive mm -hmm. immigration towards the Turkey because they were sensing that things were at that moment were not clear, you know. But afterward, in the 20s and 30s, especially after the Yugoslavia and the Republic of Turkey signed some agreements, uh, there were there were there were there was considerable immigration, especially among the ethnic Turks and some Albanians, of course, but mostly ethnic Turks from this newly associated region uh, emigrated to Turkey. And the second wave was during the 50s also. And the Turkish Republic accepted. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It, it was all uh, arranged in the state uh, according to the state agreements, but also there was kind of provision in the Yugoslav law of citizenship. The only category of uh, people who were actually forced to, uh, to show their, uh, you can say, loyalty were the Muslims from the southern regions because uh, all others uh, were accepted uh, like automatically into the citizenship of Yugoslavia. The others, the Muslims, uh, had to, but in the southern region, not in Bosnia, for example, they had they had five years to express their willingness to stay. If they stay, everything is okay. After five years, if they didn't express the willingness to stay, they were forced to leave, which is unusual, which is this kind of negative approach toward your citizenship. And uh, many, many actually during that period in the early 30s, after the implement, after this law was passed in 1929, uh, many of them used this uh, provision to actually leave. And they were, they got really quickly, they were really quickly got permission to leave. They were erased from uh, all books, including the books of uh, military conscripts and everything, and they were allowed to leave. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, when, uh... Now, I have a question for the uh, speaker who made the second presentation. Uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, Atatürk, uh, Chief Rabbi. How did they meet the Chief Rabbi? And um, how did uh, the Chief Rabbi, Haim Naum, became a part of the Lausanne uh, delegation? Thank you. So, so you, you asked me about. Sorry. You asked me about uh, Chief Rabbi uh, Naum Effendi. That's why. Uh, and um, uh, I I don't uh, understand really your 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 question. But um, the shall shall I? Um, yes. uh, so the question is how uh, did. Um, uh, uh, Naum Efendi um, meet uh, Mustafa Kemal and joined the Lausanne Convention? Uh, I don't know how it was uh, settled, but uh, uh, I know that now Naum Efendi was a, a really known, um, it, it was, he has a many, many contacts uh, from uh, every side. And uh, he was known as a, a personality, well-known personality, who uh, also was really well introduced in uh, European, European capital, especially in Paris. He had uh, access to the Quai d'Orsay, to every uh, important people in the Quai d'Orsay. So uh, I, I think that for Mustafa Kemal, it was really an important uh, asset to have in the Lausanne delegation because uh, he, he, uh, he was a personality who, who can um, talk really with uh, people inside uh, the conference and uh, make things a, a bit easier. Uh, so it's basically for the, the, the contact that now Mefendi uh, has in um, Europe and I think that uh, that's why it was important for Mustafa Kemal. I don't know if I uh, answered your question as you wanted. Uh, 
ben yine I I have another question. Now we talk about 1912 the Bal Balkan wars and how during the wars Muslims had to flee the country and how they had to come to Asia Minor and this is what created 1915 some people allege we learned how to kill from them this is what some uh, people people say so this is what some writers say I mean is this a misunderstanding on my part or do you think that uh, mass immigration during or after um, the Balkan Boers uh, played a role um, in the um, massacres against the Armenians. Yeah, I, I heard about these uh, allegations and uh, you know claims. Uh, it, it, in a way, you can say it, 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 it's, it's, it has good grounds, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go uh, like. The picture is always in history not black and white. It's always like gray and very, very shades of gray. You can say, probably, in many cases that is the that is the case. But for example, as you know, we must understand one thing: the Balkan First Balkan War was very short war. It was war. You know, people tend to forget it was practically the last war of the 19th century. The last war, which which ended in armistice, which ended in negotiations and signing of peace agreements, then it get, uh, started again. It lasted last, like three months, tops. The what happened during, uh, but especially after the first Balkan War counts. That is the time where, for example, you have the books, uh, harbor books in Salonika. Uh, where you can actually follow the number of immigrants to the to the Asia Minor, that is. So I think that it is time finally that we leave the Balkan Wars as the wars, and to look into them in the more broad, broad, broader context, especially this one, which which uh, speaks about immigration. For example, Bulgarians already in 1950 when they arrived to Macedonia, they did make a census, and they make detailed account of every region in Macedonia uh, about the properties and uh, their owners, where they are at that moment and why did they leave, for example. So I think that we're in a good good position to slowly uh, maybe demystify some of the claims, but also to maybe to, to confirm others. Question uh, uh, online uh, coming from Baki Tezcan uh, for uh, Ms. Uh, Fry. Uh, if she can hear us, can you hear us? I can hear you. Good. So uh, there's a question um, which asks about um, Ottoman uh, Assyrians uh, more generally. If you have uh, come across in your research evidence about Ottoman Assyrians, uh, their situation uh, at this period and also uh, how they did uh, with regard to deportations. With regard to what? I De couldn't deportations. Oh, deportations, okay. Right. Okay, so in the Ottoman air areas adjacent to Qajar, Iran, uh, there lived three kinds of Assyrians belonging to different denominations and language uh, dialects. In Iraq, which became Iraq, Mesopotamia, uh, there were and still are a large number of Catholic converts from the Church of the East, and they were not affected by deportations at all. However, they were affected by the fact that others from uh, Eastern and Eastern Turkey and from Northwest Iran who survived the the genocide came into Iraq and that created a lot of conflicts eventually for the rest of the 20th century. However, the people who were affected most by deportations were those who lived in the cities like Mardin, Diyarbakir, um, even Van and the people who lived in the mountains. These belonged to different denominations. 
the people who lived in the cities, like uh, Midiat, Mardin, Diyarbakir, and so on, they were highly Armenicized. In other words, many of them associated, intermarried, and worked with American missionaries who focused on Armenian language and Armenian schools. So those people belonged to the Syriac Orthodox Church and they were very badly affected by the deportations because they were considered as, uh, like the Armenians were, as Christians who were seditious. And so they lost many, many members. Few survived. They were also affected by the uh, 1895 uh, 96 massacres. Uh, so they had a very uh, difficult uh, time, very similar to that of the Armenians. The third group has perhaps lost the most in terms of its land and its, and its ability to survive. And that was the mountain Assyrians which were very closely uh, affiliated with the Assyrians on the northwest, uh, in northwest Iran. Those Assyrians in the mountains, the Hakari Mountains, um, housed not only Assyrians who were still retained tribal affiliations and still do today among the survivors, but, they all, but it also was the seat of the Patriarch of the Church of the East. One of his brothers was in Istanbul at the time that the Armenian intellectuals were rounded up and he disappeared. It was as a punishment to the patriarch who was uh, mentored in many ways by the British, the Archbishop's mission to, to the Assyrians. Those Assyrians in the Hakari region have lost all their presence in Hakari. They fled, they were killed, uh, most of the attackers were local Kurds, and those who survived straggled into northwest Iran from where they also had to flee eventually because the Ottoman army came into there as well. So in terms of deportations, all of the Assyrian regions were affected by uh, the deportations of, of the war and the genocide. The ones in Mesopotamia were affected because they, they were had they were flooded with other refugees. The ones in Hekari were totally dislocated, completely. Uh, I think there's only one person there now, and he is from Australia, and uh, they, the churches are all dilapidated. The ones who were living in the cities, however, have maintained a presence. Many of them are have emigrated to Europe and support those churches and communities that survive. Uh, in the Iran region, the population of Assyrians that was concentrated in northwest Iran and the villages in the map that I showed you, that population, which was the sole population in Iran, uh, has, is down to about 5,000 people. So those villages have been emptied, as have the Armenian villages, uh, replaced by Muslims from various parts of uh, Azerbaijan. And the Assyrian concentration in, uh, in Iran is uh, something around 15,000, most of them living in Tehran. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for your answer. Um, so if, um, there, uh, if there aren't any questions uh, or comments, perhaps we can um, close um, this panel. Uh, and um, thank our uh, speakers uh, here and also online, Ms. Fry. Uh, thank you. <laughs>